prophet Amos. If you are familiar with any verse in Amos, good chance it's this one, Amos 5, 24. Let justice thunder down like a waterfall. Let righteousness flow like a mighty river that never runs dry. As I was beginning to uh, uh, study for the passage today earlier on in the week, there was also a national event uh, that was taking place, the State of the Union Address, in which our president uh, went before the whole country and said, this is how things are going. And, you know, one of the slogans, uh, one of the things that he wanted to emphasize is making America great again. And as I pondered that, I, I thought, what does make a nation great? What criteria would you use? You know, I understand from a presidential point of view, he has certain criteria, certain things, uh, emphases that uh, he is working on and, and so forth. But from God's standpoint, what would God say is the state of our union? And that really becomes a theme and insight into the book of Amos for us. The prophet Amos was called by God to proclaim the state of the union, uh, particularly for the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. Amos was called to speak out, to speak clearly, to speak forcefully, to address the glaring need and the, and the, the, the deep concerns which were going on in that nation. Amos 1, verses 1 and 2 start out this way. The words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa. He was a shepherd by trade. The vision he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake. And that helps us identify uh, if we got the right earthquake when uh, his time of service was. Two years before the earthquake, when Uzziah was king of Judah and Jeroboam son of Jehoash was king of Israel. And so scholars trying to put this all into uh, perspective, coming up for a timeline for Amos. Uh, the king of Judah at that time was Uzziah, the king of Israel, Jeroboam II. And uh, the earthquake is dated to about 750 B.C., so somewhere in that time frame of 760 to 750 B.C. was the time of Amos. We know when we uh, studied the book of Hosea, that that was a time of great prosperity. National prosperity was skyrocketing. Israel was doing very well. It was strong militarily on, on a lot of levels. You could say Israel was great. But as we, when we read through the book of Amos, the concern was is that morality was in the picture. Morality was going down, though the, the nation had lots of blessings on the one hand, things, it was prosperous times, but also deeply troubling times. And if you recalled from the book of Hosea, that nation was conquered by Assyria in 722 B.C., just less than 30 years after the ministry of Amos. God brought judgment to the nation of Israel for its sins. And so God called Amos to speak to both uh, kingdoms, kingdom of Judah, but primarily to the kingdom of Israel. Verse 2 says, the Lord says, the Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds dry up and the top of Mount Carmel withers. Mount Carmel is, is just a, a symbol in, in the northern kingdom of great fertility and, and prosperity and an abundance of rain. And here 
This message comes, and it's just like, you know, shouting through a megaphone. The prophet Amos comes, and and his whole book, nine chapters, again and again and again, the the sins, the needs, the, the, the dysfunctionality of the nation in relationship to God's law is highlighted. Amos is called sometimes the angry prophet. And it's not so much that that was his disposition. But he was called upon to give warning. That was his job. That was his message. That was his responsibility to warn the northern kingdom that if their ways did not change, judgment would come. As I was uh, doing some reading, I uh, came across the fact that, uh, you remember that tsunami that devastated the Indonesian uh, islands? It was you know, maybe uh, 10 years or so ago. Well, they had placed buoys out in the ocean, which were meant to be early warning signals. These buoys were supposed to measure uh, the waves and and what was going out there and give advanced warning to the mainland about here comes a tsunami. But unfortunately, nobody was paying attention to the buoys, and they had fallen into disrepair. Most of them were not functioning when that tsunami hit. They failed to do their job. They failed to give warning, and because of that, people suffered greatly. And so when Amos shouts this message to Israel, it's not that he's just, you know, uh, an angry man and has to get this off of his chest. It's because he is empowered and called by God to warn people of the coming judgment out of love, out of concern, out of a desire that they do repent, change their ways, and return to him. And so Amos' message is a challenging message. To understand his message, you need to understand God's covenant, God's agreement, God's relationship with his people Israel. God came to Abraham and he said to him, I am your God. I will provide for you. I will protect you. I will save you. I will be that, that, that strong person in your life, the one that you can look to and, and trust and depend upon. I am your God, but Israel, you are my people. You must love me. You must obey me, and and you must serve me. And and sometimes we get caught up in that obedience part, which was certainly a strong dimension of the covenant. But it was not taken outside of the relational dimension. To love God is to keep his commandments. As I was sharing with the kids this morning, the first and greatest commandment, love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when you love him, you will desire to keep his commandments. You must love, you must obey, you must serve. Deuteronomy chapter 6 says, Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord your God, um, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors promised you. And so God said to them, listen, this is the covenant. You keep the covenant and it will bring life to you. Worship God only, trust him completely, treat others uh, justly, care for the poor and needy, follow the Ten Commandments, love God and others, and this will bring blessings. However, if you worship idols, if you trust in yourself, if you take advantage of others and mistreat the poor and the needy, if you break my commandments, if you steal, you lie, and you cheat, then curses will come upon you, resulting in death. This forms the backdrop to the book of Amos. This is the foundational thing that Amos is drawing upon and calling Israel and their attention to the fact that they were breaking God's covenant. Deuteronomy 6 says, And if we are careful to obey all of this law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded to us, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. And I want to take a little bit of time to explore that term righteousness because it's key to understanding the book of Amos. 
What is righteousness? I did not consult uh, Vanderway and Sons uh, uh, bricklayers, masonry, but from my limited understanding, when you're building a block wall or building a stone wall, you start out with one stone that has been shaped carefully to form a right angle, something that is strong and firm, and that's the cornerstone. From that cornerstone, then, the direction of the building goes out in each uh, way, and that forms the straight line that you use as a guide to build the rest of the building. Now, laying that cornerstone is important. You want to get it plumb, you want to get it true, and, and from that plumb line, which is showing the, the exact vertical, you can create uh, the horizontal dimensions and go out from there. Everything has to be lined up and aligned to the cornerstone. The cornerstone is key to the whole building. The word righteousness has as its root the meaning straight. Remember how we talked about Hebrew words have a whole range of meaning? Righteousness is straightness. Something that follows the pattern, follows according to the guidelines that are given, you know, which, which goes along in that straight line, in that straight course. And so in the book of Deuteronomy, when it says you need to be careful to obey God's law, this will be our righteousness. In other words, we will show that we love God because we're keeping his commandments. We're following him in line. We're doing what he says. Righteousness. So righteousness is this plumb line, this, this standard that is set. God's righteousness, he says, I will provide, I will protect, I will save. Our righteousness we must love, we must obey, we must serve. Let me try to illustrate. Raising kids. How do you raise kids who want to obey? <laughs> okay? I don't know, but I know my, my bent, my nature is, is that there's always this want to do my own thing, my own way. But the key in raising children who want to obey is building a quality relationship between you and your child, showing your child that you will provide, you will protect, you will take care of them, that you're you know, interested in what's good for them, that there's a, a, a dimension of the relationship which is solid and strong, and then that gives you the foundation to say to them, now listen, do things this way. When you do things this way, it will be helpful. It will work out better. Now, obviously, when you're working with a two-year-old, they're not comprehending all these things. But you're laying the groundwork. You're laying the foundation. You're giving them instruction and guidelines. Now, sometimes when they misbehave, yep, a little discipline is needed. Sometimes nice, firm discipline is needed. Kids don't like that. You don't love me, ma, 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 ma. You know, and if a parent caves at that point, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean it. I'm gonna, you don't have to do it. You're in big trouble. Okay? But you say, Billy, this is what's good for you. I'm only doing this for your good, right? How many parents have said that before? Okay? But the idea is, is that you want to set that firm, straight line for them to follow. When finally, hopefully, they get it and they come back and they say, I'm sorry, Daddy. I didn't mean it. You're not like, well, you better shape up next time. No, you welcome the kid back in your arms and say, I know, sometimes keeping the law is hard. But I'm glad you're trying I'm glad you want to do what's right. That's our relationship to God. We don't always do things right, but it's the want to there because the love relationship is there. That forms the foundation of the covenant. And that's what Amos uses. 
when he challenges God's people Israel. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. They were crooked. They weren't straight anymore. The wall had to be taken down because it was no longer plumb. It was no longer true. You know, that's a word for sin. Going off, going in the wrong direction, crooked. God says, I have set a straight standard and my people are not measuring up. And then Amos goes into the specifics that God uh, laid out to them. Hear this! You who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land. You skimp on the measure, boosting the price, cheating with dishonest scales, buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. In all their business transactions, the businessmen were always looking for an advantage to to, um, have inaccurate weights. Uh, so that when you, you, you bought something and you weighed it out, actually you were giving them less than what was true. Uh, adding the, the, the sweepings, uh, throwing the, the, the chaff and the junk in the bag as well. And in many ways, just taking advantage of people. Hear this word. You fat cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria. You women who oppress the poor. You know, I'm really not recommending you go around calling women this. You know, it's not going to go real well, but Amos is pointing to, first of all, a fat cow is a symbol of prosperity, of richness, of abundance. When you were fat in ancient times, it means you had plenty. You could eat all that you wanted. Your scale was not you know, you know, your determiner of, of your wealth. It's just like, no, someone who had a few extra pounds meant they had lots of blessings. But these ladies had grown fat through greed. And that greed and that uh, bounty came at the expense of others. You oppress the poor. You crush the needy. You say to your husbands, we want more. Give us more. Bring us some more drinks. Their eyes were just bent on accumulation, on self-indulgence, self-satisfaction, and it drove an unjust system in which the rich became richer and the oppressed were driven further and further into the ground. Then speaking to the men, Amos says, you lie on beds adorned with ivory. You lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and on fattened calves. You strum away on your harps like David. You improvise on musical instruments. And the idea is is there that music was, was originated in praise of God and now you're just using it for your own entertainment and you have no regard for God. You use the finest, uh, you drink wine by the bowlful, you use the finest lotions, and you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Joseph is another name for that whole northern uh, kingdom. You don't see the reality of what's happening in your land. You're focusing only on the wealth and the luxury and, and, and your might and power, and you don't see that destruction is just around the corner. Douglas Stewart, a commentator uh, writing about Amos, says, Israel reached what was probably its height in terms of economic prosperity. Agriculture was flourishing. International peace allowed Israel to gain wealth via international trade and a new economic order. Wealth came to those who were involved in this trade, those who were engaged in slave labor or in charging high interest rates. They had the means to buy up the food in the countryside and resell it to a captive audience in the cities, making enormous profits. Excessive wealth led to the creation of a leisured upper class who increasingly adopted a decadent lifestyle at the expense of the poor. 
Things were great in Israel if you were in the upper class. Things weren't so great if it was your hard labor that was making others rich. You see that righteousness before God. God's righteousness, but then our righteousness. And our righteousness always has a horizontal dimension to it. Jesus says the first and greatest command, love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But a second is like it. It fits it. It complements it. You must also love your neighbor as yourself. That's justice. Another key term in the book of Amos. Righteousness before God, keeping the, the law, living morally and with, with great piety, but then also justice in treating your neighbor fairly, treating him as you yourself would want to be treated. This is what God was looking for. And this is what led Amos to declare, let justice roll down like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. How do we apply that to us? How does that fit in our day and age? We are believers who live in America. America is a wonderful country. I love my country. But my patriotism cannot blind me to our country's needs and wrongs. My allegiance is, first of all, to the Lord, and secondarily, to a flag. The standards for my life are judged by God and not dictated by those of like mind around me. When we ask, what makes a nation great? It's easy to, to put forward the things like economic prosperity and military might and, and border security and all those other things, which may be very important. I'm not denying that. But if it's done with neglect to the matters of justice, then we've got a problem. And so I'm speaking this morning to people, some who may identify with one political party, some who may identify with another political party. This is not about political parties. It's not about politics. It's about who are we as the church of Jesus Christ, as followers of Jesus Christ? What standard is set before us? And Proverbs 14 says, righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a disgrace to any people. And so when we think about that sin, we say, oh yeah, we want our lives to be righteous before God. We want our piety. We want morality. We want these things in our life to be exactly right. And when we see others who aren't aligned, boy, we'll let them know they're out of alignment. And sometimes we look at people in the, uh, on the uh, other side of the political spectrum. And we say, oh, I got so sick and tired all the things that they're bringing up. But sometimes we miss out on the fact that loving God and loving others are meant to work together. They're not polar opposites, though it may feel like that in our current political climate. Loving God and righteousness is compatible with loving others and practicing justice. They're two sides of the same coin. They belong together and they were demonstrated perfectly by our Savior, Jesus. When you read through the New Testament, you can tell that Jesus also knows the covenant, both 
dimensions. Loving God, loving others. He's familiar with the prophets and their call for justice. Jesus said, now the teacher asked him, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And This is the first and the greatest commandment, but the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two. And then when he addresses the Pharisees, the Pharisees were the upstanding people in society. They were the ones who loved God with all of their heart. They set the standard for morality and piety. Jesus says to them, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices. You're very meticulous in laying out your, your mint, your dill, your cumin. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness, you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Both need to be there. You can tell James has read the book of Amos. He writes, now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and your silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages that you have failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived Lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence, you have fattened yourselves for the day of slaughter. New Testament also is concerned with justice, particularly for the poor, the needy, the oppressed. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called upon to follow his standard of righteousness. I am setting a plumb line among my people. Yes, us. Will God spare us in that time of judgment? How do our lives align not only on that vertical dimension, but also on that horizontal dimension and how we treat our neighbors. It's so easy to ignore. It's so easy just to be concerned about making sure your life is aligned with God, me and my God and, and my personal faith without realizing that your faith calls you to speak out on behalf of the oppressed, to work for justice, to work for equality. The Old Testament and the New Testament speak forcefully that this is the standard for God's people. Is there any hope for us? The call first comes to confess. To confess where we've been apathetic, indifferent, perhaps even hostile to those who are working towards justice and peace. Not that their agenda is always perfect. Not that their agenda is always on track. But are we listening to the deep concerns? Are we trying to comprehend the breadth of the need that is there and lend our voice, biblically informed and guided, to the discussion? Do we need to confess our complicity? In, in the injustice that is done to others. We must pray. We must pray for our nation. We must pray.
pray for our church, for ourselves, for each other. We must ask God for mercy, but then also for strength and wisdom and knowing how to engage in our society in a way that is biblically true, honoring to God, but yet concern for our neighbor. Whatever skin color or language theirs may be, or whatever is their nation of origin, or how they got to this country. We pray for wisdom. How do we work through these problems? Do we work through the issues of our day, which look for solutions which are whole, which truly represent good? It's not just noise from one side or the other, but it's looking for God's way through the midst of it. That's biblical shalom, biblical peace. That we repent. Repenting is turning around, changing, pledging before God, God, I want to do things differently. I want my life to be faithful to you, but also loving towards others. Show me how to do that. Seek good, not evil. Then you will live. Then the Lord your God Almighty will be with you, just as you say he is. Hate evil, love good, maintain justice in the courts. Perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph. And then finally, trust. Trust. Trust in God that he will work it out. You see, when, when we look back again at that covenant and that plumb line that is there, God's righteousness that says, I will provide, I will protect, I will save. That's the promise that he made to his people Israel. And even though he must judge them and discipline them, yet his heart longs for them to provide, to protect, to save them, as he also does for us. And so at the very end of the book of Amos, just a handful of verses in the last chapter, God says this through Amos, I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls. I will restore its ruins. I will rebuild it as it used to be. I will bring back my people Israel from exile. I will do that because I am God. In my righteousness, I will make it happen. Even if your lives are broken, even if your lives are out of alignment, even if you can't draw a straight line, I will draw it for you. And, the God, and God sent a son of David to rebuild David's fallen shelter. God sent his own son Jesus to become the new cornerstone through which our lives are redirected. God sent His Son to pay the penalty for the sins of the whole world. The judgment that should justly be upon us was placed on Him. He took our sin and we received His righteousness. And so Peter would write, See, I lay a stone in Zion a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. I don't know what this message does for you today. Perhaps it arouses anger. But try to analyze that anger. Is what has been spoken here today come from the Word of God? How 
Is that convicting you and me? Whatever our political persuasion, whatever it may be, it's not about politics. It's about righteousness. What is truly righteous before God? And I know for myself, the alignment of my life is not completely straight. But as I trust in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I receive God's mercy and forgiveness. And then through his Holy Spirit, gradually, painstakingly, sometimes with resistance within me, God aligns me with his cornerstone. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood, but also Jesus' righteousness. I dare not trust anything else out there in this world or society to give me guidance, to show me what's straight and true. I have Jesus as my cornerstone. I want him to take me and fit me into his building perfectly straight, rising to become a temple, the house, the people of God. The church of Jesus Christ is meant to be this, this glorious kingdom that others will see and look at and say, oh, that's how it's supposed to be done. Now I get it, what it means to love God and love others because they see it in action through the church of Jesus Christ. That's my passion. That's my desire. Would you join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, how broken we are. In many ways, broken like the nation of Israel. Would you call us to account? But in that harsh word of judgment, there is mercy and grace and a solid rock, a firm foundation, a cornerstone that has been set in place that all who trust in him will not be put to shame. Help us, Jesus, align our lives with yours that righteousness would flow down like a mighty river and justice like a never-failing stream. In your name we pray. Amen.